appreciate the good singing. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. When uh, I was seeking the Lord's will about the message that He wanted me to preach this morning, I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to preach it. My flesh doesn't want to preach this kind of message. But it's a message that's needed. Because you see, uh, C.S. Lewis, who's a famous author, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he was also a Christian apologist in the mid-20th century, he died in 1963. C.S. Lewis said this about the subject of hell. He said, there is no doctrine which I would willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. I was talking to a young man who is a pastor of a church. If I said his name, you know exactly who it was. But I was talking to a young man who is a pastor of a church and he said, Chris, I told him I was going to be preaching on hell. He said, Chris, I preached a message on hell three or four weeks ago, and he said, I had people come to me in tears, saying, we have not heard a message on hell for 10 to 15 years. Hadn't heard it over a decade. Because you see, the problem is, is most churches, a lot of pastors, a lot of evangelical leaders, a lot of people throughout different denominations, they have basically said that I'm not going to preach on hell either because it's going to make people leave or they've stopped believing in it altogether. As a matter of fact, there was a Harris poll that was conducted here in the United States a few years ago, 2015 I believe it was. And it said that 69% of Americans that were polled believed in hell. Now you think to yourself, well that's 69%. Well, let's do the math though. 31% did not believe in it. That's almost one out of every three. So you stop and think about that the next time you're out in public, at a grocery store or wherever. Basically, one out of every three people you see do not believe in a physical hell. And that's here in the United States of America. That's not in the darkest regions of Africa. That's here in the United States. But of that 69% that said that they believe in hell, their definition of what hell is was all over the board. As far as, well, you believe in hell, what is it? It was all over the board as far as what they actually think it is. And of the 69% that said that they believed in a literal physical hell, 98% of them said they're not going. Only 2% said that they thought they would. Those are the most honest people in the group. Because you're not going to convince me that 69% of Americans believe in hell and 98% of them are not going. You're right. Because they're saying that they think they're not going because they've lived a good life. Or they think that they're not going because they're simply an American citizen. Or that they're a member of a certain church. That's not going to cut it. You see, the scripture tells us that hell is my destination by default. That's where I'm supposed to go by default. Yeah. And you see, the problem is, is that when churches stop preaching on hell, and you tell somebody that you need to get saved, you need to go to heaven, well, the problem is, is they're like, well, why? What's the alternative? And that's the problem. Nobody's telling them what the alternative is if they don't get saved. As a matter of fact, a gentleman by the name of John Henry Jouett who was an influential British Protestant preacher, in 1912, he was at the Yale Convention, and this is what he said. Hell is the dark background on which the brilliant picture of the gospel is painted. But without the background, you have no picture. Stop and think about the words that he's saying there. Hell is the background for the picture of the glorious gospel. But you remove the background, you have no picture. In other words, what the man is simply saying here is this. 
You can talk about heaven and you can talk about the streets of gold all you want to, but if you're not letting people know if you don't get saved, this is the alternative, then they're not going to understand or care. Well, what I want to do this morning, so I want to take a look at this. We're going to start in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, starting with verse 42. Now, these are the words of Jesus Christ Himself. As a matter of fact, no other person and the Scriptures mention this more than Him. Mark chapter 9, verse 42, it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in Me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed, having two hands, to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than have two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Five times God says... Jesus Christ says five times the fire is not quenched. I think he's trying to get something across, don't you? I think he's trying to get something very significant across in regards to this place. Well, what I want to do this morning as best I can, first of all, what I want to do is I want to give you our status in God's eyes. Because this morning... I'm going to preach on hell by default. But this evening I'm going to preach on heaven by adoption. And you'll Amen. see the difference. Amen. But the status in God's eyes. How does God see us in His eyes? Romans 3.23. I know that you're familiar with this verse of Scripture. But let me read it to you. Romans 3.23 says, For all, A-L-L, -L, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's everybody. A-L-L -L means everybody. All. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, let me go a little bit further in this. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 18. We know that Jesus Christ is talking to Nicodemus here. In the Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 18, He says, Jesus Himself says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Romans 6.23 then tells me that the wages of sin is death. Why does it matter? You see, I could, if I was not saved, and somebody says, what do you have to do to go to hell? The answer is nothing. I don't have to do anything to go to hell. I'll live my life. I'll do my profession. I'll enjoy my hobbies. I'll enjoy whatever it is that brings me pleasure and enjoyment and fulfillment in this life. And when I exhale my last breath in this life, I'll gasp my next one in hell. See, there's nothing to it. What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. It's hell by default. That's the status in God's eyes in relation to every single human being who has ever lived. It's hell by default. <coughs> now you see, God doesn't want you to go there. But because of the fall of man, because of the imperfection of man, He has to do that because He's a holy, just, righteous man. God. There is no plan B. If you don't get saved, this is it. It's hell by default. Now I'll tell you, I could preach this in any church across this country. And I guarantee you that I'd have people who would doubt and disbelieve. Yeah. They'll say, I don't believe in hell. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to say this at the beginning of this message. I'm going to say it at the end of the message to drive this point home. Just because you don't believe doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I cannot with the naked eye see a molecule, but it doesn't mean it's not real. It exists. There are planets 
that are in other galaxies billions of light years away we do not know exist. It doesn't mean they're not real. We haven't seen them. Our telescopes aren't powerful enough to see them. But just because we can't see them, it doesn't mean that they're not real. Just because I haven't never, I've never physically seen hell or I can't point you to a road sign that says this is where it is, that doesn't mean it's not real. It exists whether you believe in it or not. There are people day after day after day that drop into hell and they thought to themselves, I didn't think it was real, it didn't matter. They still win. That's the standing in God's eyes. Now what I want to do is I want to give you the sensations of hell as best as I can. Number one, what would, what would it be like if you went there right now? What about the skin and your body? I want you to imagine your entire body right now on fire with massive third degree burns covering your entire body. Have you ever been to a burn ward, a burn unit in a hospital? It is not a pretty sight. Have you ever yourself been burned, maybe with a first or a second degree burn? It hurts, doesn't it? You don't sit there and say, man, I want to do this again. Imagine your entire body, third degree burns all over, and no relief. This happens every second of every hour of every day, all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, if for no other reason I wouldn't want to go there, that's enough. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. amen. That by itself. Nobody in their right mind says, I want to get burned today. Nobody in their right mind is going to stick their hand into a fire and let that fire burn their hand to a crisp. You don't do that. you got enough sense not to. And yet, people don't have enough sense to take care of their eternal soul. Because they're more concerned about this life, which has a very short lifespan. And they don't even think about the life of Imagine you are burning. Can I tell you, people that are in hell right now, that's exactly what's happening to them. They are on, they're in flames, they're on fire, they're burned. And God has given them a body that will be burning and experiencing pain, but will not burn up. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if you would burn up eventually, but you don't. You're still burning, and you're still burning. And you're still burning. The rich man. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. This is a true story. This is not fiction. This man actually lived. This man actually died. This man is still in hell to this day. In Luke chapter 16. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was pleasure crazy enough. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And where? In hell. He lifted up his eyes. Now, I want to stop here and make this very important comment. Just because somebody's rich does not mean they go to hell. And just because somebody is by definition poor does not mean they go to heaven. It has nothing to do with your economic standing. It has nothing to do with your tax bracket. It has everything to do with whether you trust or reject Jesus Christ. Your money, your, how much you got in your bank account, whatever you got in 401k has nothing to do with it. Not one thing. Just because he was rich didn't mean he went to heaven. It has nothing to do with it. But this man... In hell, he lifted up his eyes and he was immediately in torments. Notice how it's plural. I'm going to get to that. In hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. I've already given you one. And folks, I'm going to say it again. If, that was, if, if for no other reason, that's enough to say, I don't want to go there. I don't want to burn like that for all eternity. Number two. 
What do you see? I want everybody in this congregation to do me a favor. I want everybody right now to close your eyes, please. Close your eyes as if we were doing the invitation. Do you see anything? No. You see nothing but darkness, don't you? Imagine that you see nothing but darkness every second of every hour all the time. You never see a sun. You never see a tree. You never see grass. You never see water. You never see the clouds. You never see a sky. You never see your, the face of your loved one. You don't see anything. It's pitch black all the time. You can open your eyes. To give you an illustration, I went caving. This was probably 20 years ago or more. On a youth trip. We went caving up in North Georgia. And our guy took us deep. I don't know how far we went into this cave. This thing was massive. Well, we went at least an hour into this cave. And we had literally had the helmets with the lights on. And he says, I want everybody to turn off the lights. <coughs> and when you did, you could literally feel the darkness on you. It wasn't this case of if we turned out the lights in this auditorium, it would be dark, but it would, it would, you would still see. It was so dark in that cave, you literally could put your hand up to your face and you could not even tell it was there. You could literally feel the darkness upon you. Folks, think about that. When you go there, you don't see anything. There are people in hell right now saying, I'd give anything if I could just see the sky. I'd give anything if I could just see a lake, or a flower, or a tree, or something. I want to see something. They can't see it. Why? Because hell is in the heart of the earth. There's no light there. If for no other reason I wouldn't want to go to hell, it was because you don't see anything. It's just darkness all the time. People are terrified of the dark. Did you know that? There are people who will not go to bed at night without having some kind of a light on in their house. Whether it's in the bathroom or in the kitchen or somewhere, they have to have some kind of a light on because it bothers them to be in a house that's completely pitch dark. Well, you don't have any night lights in hell. You don't have anything like that. You don't have a flashlight. You don't have a candle. You have nothing. It's pitch dark. You want to know what you see in hell? Nothing. Number three. What about your stifled breath? You see, I told you that when you exhale your last breath in this life, you'll gasp your next one in hell if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Have you ever stood in front of an oven that was on? You had the thing cranked up to 400 or 450. You were making, you were baking something in the oven or preparing dinner, and you pull that lid back, and the heat hits you in the face. Does it not take your breath away? Yes, it does. You, you kind of it makes you gasp because of the intense heat hitting you in the face. Well, folks, imagine that your every second of your existence. You're constantly, you're constantly trying to get your breath like that because of the intense heat. You want to live like that for eternity? I don't. I don't think anybody in the right mind would. But that's what's happening right now. There's people that are gasping just to get air in their lungs. Stifled breath. What about the sound? When they can get their breath, what do you hear in hell? I want you to imagine you're in a room. It's completely dark. You couldn't, like that cave, you can't see your hand in front of your face. In that room, there's 20 people in the room with you. And those 20 people are screaming at the top of their lungs and they do it for 24 straight hours. They don't stop. They're screaming, they're begging, they're crying, and they're doing that non-stop for 
24 straight hours. Let me ask you something. Would that not drive you insane? It would drive you crazy. You would be doing like this. You would want to pull your ears off your head. Because you would be like, make it stop. Make them stop. I'm tired of hearing the screaming. Make it stop. Please, somebody, make it stop. But it won't. I said 20 people. Now multiply that by a billion. Imagine billions and billions of people screaming at the top of their lungs and you can't make it stop. It won't stop. It's every second of every hour all the time. Most people can't stand loud noises. Especially if it just keeps on and on and on. You're like, you just shut up. When you turn that racket off. You want them to quit. You won't quit. You will not quit there. It's all the time. With something else. What about the smell? What do you smell? You can't see anything. But all you hear is incessant screaming and crying and agony. What do you smell? You ever smell a burning flesh? You ever smell something that was on fire, a dead animal or something that was on fire? That makes you want to retch. It makes you so sick that you could, and whatever you've eaten is coming up because you can't take it. Because of the horrible, awful smell of that flesh burning. That's all you get to smell. Something burning. Multiplied by billions. And you smell, oh, by the way, you smell your own. You smell your own burning flesh. I don't know about you, but I hate smelling stuff like that. But that's all you smell. There's no flowers to smell in hell. There's no wonderful aroma or fragrance that you can spray on yourself or spray on somebody else to get rid of that stint. No, you can't do that. All you smell is burning flesh every second, every hour, all the time. I don't know about you, but this, is, this does not sound like a place I want to go to. Not at all. Let me give you a few more. What about your swollen tongue? Let's see what the rich man says here. In verse 23 it says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in tor torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, obviously we have to put this in proper context that Prior to the death of Jesus Christ, the Old Testament saints were in a place called paradise, which also at that time was in the heart of the earth. But it wasn't like hell. And there was actually a chasm, there was a, a, a gap between the, the compartment of paradise and the compartment of hell itself. But in this particular instance, God allowed this rich man so that he could explain what hell was like. God allowed this rich man to pierce through the darkness and see on the other side of that chasm, he saw paradise, whatever it was like. He saw the man who was the father of the Jewish nation. He saw Abraham. And he saw the same poor beggar who had sores all over his body, who hung out around the front gate of his luxurious estate, hoping to get some kind of a prong, some kind of a handout. He happened to see this same guy, but he wasn't in the same condition. And he was there with Abraham. He sees these two. And verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Folks, he didn't even ask for a glass of water. He asked for a drop on the tip of Lazarus' finger. When you're, so, when you're in so much pain that just that would seem like relief, that's hard. Imagine you're in such pain that your tongue is swollen. Have you ever had a 
Have you ever heard of people that there was so much pain that they were literally biting their tongue? They were biting on their tongue because the pain that they felt biting their tongue was more pleasurable than the pain that they were experiencing somewhere else. That's what people are doing right now. They're biting, I wouldn't do it myself, but they're biting down on their tongue. To somehow try to find relief. And they're desperate for water. I have a cup of water right here. There's not one person in hell that wouldn't do anything for what I've got in this cup. They'd give anything for this half drank cup of water. And they, don't, they wouldn't care that I drank out of it. It wouldn't matter to them at all. They'd gladly take it. He didn't ask for even that. But a swollen tongue and pain and biting on it. A couple more things on the sensations of hell. What are you standing on in hell? I said, what do you see in hell? The answer is nothing. What are you standing in hell? The answer is the same. Nothing. You see, when you're in the heart of the earth, when you're in hell itself, there's not, there's not a ground. Some people think that hell is like these caverns with lava. And, no. Have you ever had a dream where you were falling from, a hot, from such a high distance that it literally jerked you awake? You were dreaming that you were falling and you were about to hit the pavement, you were about to hit the ground or something, and it literally jerked you away. And you're like, man, I'm glad that was just a dream. Well, that's not a dream. Anymore. They are free fall. They're tumbling in this void of blackness. They can never get the relief of standing on something firm. They can never sit down. They can never rest on something, lean on something. They're constantly tumbling in this state of free fall without any rest. They're doing that all the time, every second of every hour, of every day that they're there. <coughs> they're constantly doing this. It doesn't sound like a fun place. All of this, and I'll give you this one more about the sensation of hell. If all of these other things were not enough, the last one is being separated from your family, your friends, pleasures of this life, but most importantly, the Savior Himself. Do you have any idea how lonely it is in hell? even though you hear the screams of billions of people that will not stop, but you're alone. You have no friend to talk to. You have no wife or husband to embrace. You have no kids to embrace. You have no one to give you solace, no one to give you comfort. You don't even have God Himself or the Spirit Himself resting upon you to say it's okay. You get nothing. You get nothing. No reprieve. No parole. No chance of escape. This is, what, this is what you get. This is hell by default. This is what every human being who says, I don't need God. I don't need your Jesus. He is just a myth. He's, the Bible is full of lies. It is full of myth. I don't need this. I don't believe that hell exists. Well, this is where you go. And the choice, who made the decision? Who made the choice? Me? No. You? No. It's their own choice. There's not one person who went to hell based on the decision of someone else. Everyone who went there, it was your individual If you who are listening to this, if you 
say, I don't believe, I don't care what you say, you're a nut for believing what you believe, you can say whatever you want to, I don't care. Because the decision of whether you accept or reject, that's on you, that's not on me. It's your decision. And those that are listening to this here, those that are listening by video, you've been warned. You've been warned. Now, there may be somebody who's listening to this and they say, you've convinced me. I do not want to go there. What's the solution? I'll give you the solution very quickly. We know what John chapter 3 verse 16 says. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to look at these verses of Scripture with me. I know you know them, but Romans chapter 5. Because somebody may say, I don't want to go there. What's the solution? How do I avoid this horrible place you just tried to describe? Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. He is the solution. He's the answer. He's how you get out of this default setting of going to hell. He did it. His blood, His sacrifice. He's how you escape this place. Romans chapter 10 verse 10, 10 verse 13 explains the how. He's the solution. So how do you accept the solution? Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. It's not, it does not say he'll think about it and get back with you. It does not say, well, I've got to present this to a board and we'll discuss it and we'll see if you're worthy or we'll take your quote unquote good works and put it over here and your bad works over here and I'll get back with you to see if I think you're deserved. No. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you want to go to hell? I don't think you do. And ladies and gentlemen, despite my best efforts, I still have to scratch the surface. I've tried my best to explain to you what hell is like, and I promise you, I still haven't done a good job. I promise you that. I promise you that there are people, that there are people who were rich, or famous, or celebrities, they thought they had everything under the sun, they thought they had the world as their oyster, and I promise you, one second, when they got to hell, they said, I've made a terrible mistake. But you can't hit the reset button on this. This is not like a video game where you can reset the, the setting and play it again. Life is not that way, ladies and gentlemen. It's, there's no reset button to this thing called life. And there's no reset button to this thing called eternal life. You either trust Him as your Lord and Savior, or you don't. And if you don't, this is what you've got by default. Would you bow your heads and keep preaching? Ladies and gentlemen, I've done my best to warn you about hell. You see, this is a place that's just as real as the pew you're sitting on. It's a real place. It's not, a, it's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's real. And I'm going to say this one more time. Just because you don't believe and it doesn't make it any less real. It's a real place. And folks, I want to tell you. Before the sun sets on this day, there's going to be people that will wake up in hell. There's going to be people that will exhale their last breath on planet Earth and they will gasp their next one in hell today. There were some that did it last night. 
If God's heirs is coming, there'll be people that do it year after year after year after year. And there's billions and billions and billions of people that do it throughout the centuries. It has not changed. I don't think you want to be one of those. I don't think you want to be one of those statistics of people who die in the hell. If you have a 1% doubt in your mind that you're saved, I wouldn't miss it. I'd be 100% sure. If there is 1% doubt in your mind, hey, this is, a, this is no game, folks. It's not worth saying, well, I'm 99% sure. No, you need to be 100% sure. Let there be no doubt. Maybe you know someone. Maybe you have a family member. Maybe you have a friend. Maybe you have a co-worker. Maybe you have a relative. Someone that you know. I mean, they make no bones about it. They're not saved and they don't care anything about it. They need to be aware of the alternative. Maybe you want to come down to this altar and pray for them. Pray that they'll get saved. Pray that they'll trust Christ before it's everlasting too late. What, maybe you just want to come and say, God, thank you, you were merciful to me. God, thank you, you saved my wretched soul. Because I could just as easily be there now. Thank you for saving me. Whatever the reasons are, I would encourage you to just come to the altar and do business with God. As you stand to your feet, while we have this song of invitation.